All right, guys. Uh, welcome to the Robert Show. And yes, I was facing some technical issues, so that's the reason I'm late. I'm so sorry about uh, uh, keeping you all waiting. And yes, very excited and very happy to have my today's guest, Robert Sitor, as my uh, guest on the Robert Show. And uh, Robert Sitor is a tech executive with strong experience in quantum computing and an author uh, of uh, uh, Dancing with Qubits. Uh, obviously, I've worked with. Uh, uh, Bob and um, uh, today we'll be discussing about uh, 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 Robert Sitor's quantum space journey, problems related to uh, uh, quantum where are we right now, and uh, also uh, uh, about his book and about his next plans. Also, before calling in uh, Bob, I just wanted to let you all know that uh, we are giving away two e-copies of Dancing with Qubits, uh, which is written by Bob, and we'll be happy to answer questions around it. And also, before calling in Robert, last one, uh, we'll li I would like to thank my partners, which is 365 Data Science and How to Get Analytics uh, Jobs by uh, Albert and John. So yeah, without wasting any more time, here we go. Hey, Bob, welcome to The Robert Show. I'm so sorry about the technical issues. Oh, no Such problem. a pleasure having you. <laughs> I, I prefer the technical. Yes problems were at your end and not my end because then yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's so true and uh, thanks for just uh, being out there for the folks on uh, YouTube and letting them know about why we were facing uh, such a technical delay but all sounds good now and uh, yeah uh, welcome and uh, also I've just uh, I was just letting the folks know that uh, we are giving away dancing with qubits two e copies uh, uh, that's very sweet of you to agree to give away two e copies of the book uh, for the questions asked in the session and um, uh, want to know more about you so can you start okay. with introducing yourself Robert yeah yeah, well, you know, you reach a certain age where it becomes too long a story. I, I think the, the, the short <laughs> version is <laughs> way, way back when um, I uh, yeah. trained as a theoretical mathematician. I have a PhD in, in math from Princeton. Um, but I was always very interested in computer science, and I was always pulled back and forth between the, the two of those. Uh, I started working in IBM Research uh, in 1984. Um, before I think many of your listeners were born, um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and did math basically computational mathematics, um, and then yeah. through the years I did a variety of things. I was on the business side for for about a dozen years, but you know, I've always been fascinated by computational mathematics. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Yeah. And so um, I came back to research about nine years ago to lead the mathematical sciences department, but. I started noticing in the other end of the building, they were doing this quantum computing thing. And I, you know, being a mathematician, not being a physicist, I really didn't know much about quantum at all. Okay. Um, and so wow. about five, year, five years ago, um, I started learning about it and I was very attracted to it beca because of the mathematics. Um, I kind of felt that, you know, if you, if you happen to have a lot of math, you should be able to learn it. Uh, but, but then... Uh, you know, as I myself was, was was trying to learn it, I kept finding these gaps, or I kept finding these assumptions like, well, of course you've had three years of physics, right? And therefore this is mm -hmm. obvious. And, and well, you know, I had some physics, but I didn't have three years of physics, certainly not in university. So I started thinking about ways of explaining it. And ultimately that led to dancing with qubits, which um, yeah. I, I think of as saying, I'm going to bring you back to the basic mathematics you learned yeah. when you were a teenager, high school, early college, maybe. And I'm going to remind you of that, or I'm going to explain to you what you really learned. Yeah. And step exactly. by step, fill in the pieces. So then yeah. the foundations of quantum computing would be clearer. And then I could go through it without making a lot of assumptions. And so that's what Dancing with Qubits ended up being. And um, I do a lot of talking yeah. about quantum computing, uh, about, of course, the program at IBM uh, with, with quantum. Mm. And uh, yeah. it, it was a it was a great process working with you and uh, other folks at PACT. Uh, um, Such a pleasure. Yeah. It was it was so much work. <laughs> it was so much work. <laughs> um, but um, I, yeah. I'm very pleased with the, the results. 
yeah exactly no i think uh, bob it was equally uh, more than anything i've learned uh, a lot about quantum computing it was you who you know explored that side for me at least and at least for uh, a lot of the people out there because you were you ca- came up with obviously dancing with qubits which was kind of uh, uh, very new to the people and uh, in terms of obviously quantum is uh, out there for a long time but uh, uh, exploring those areas and getting back to the basics of mathematics that you made it very clear with dancing with qubits and we could see that uh, across from the uh, the people the readers the reviewers who were out there and uh, talking about dancing with you bit so uh, i think it was fantastic uh, working with you and can't wait to see what uh, what next is coming in the quantum computing field and obviously we will be uh, talking today a lot about it um uh, just 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 going b- before going ahead uh, I, I i already see a question before even we going live from michael okay. s I, I think you might have seen it so uh, uh, how can quantum computing give us an actual picture of co- quantum reality or it is uh, is it merely a mathematical simulation very interesting question well i i responded to him briefly um initially with the question of yeah. what do you mean by quantum reality right um what is reality mm. uh, quantum computing is based yeah. on quantum mechanics and it's a very strange yeah. part of physics um it replaced a lot of the classical physics that was developed in the 1700s and the 1800s. But really, yeah. there's a lot of philosophical discussion now about why it works. You know, if you want to go back in the literature, there's things like the Copenhagen interpretation, there's the many worlds interpretation, mm-hmm. and, and several others. So this is this is what I was saying about you know re- reality. Um, Physical models uh, are are developed to try to help us explain and understand what's really happening. But in that sense, they're all models. I mean, cosmology, they're all just models. And so you shouldn't necessarily take um, it as truth versus, yes, a a collection of, of mathematical models that seem consistent with experimental results and therefore also allow us to yeah. do do some predictions. Now, what I did add on um, was that um, true quantum computing does use the principles of quantum mechanics. So if you look in the physics mm-hmm. literature, you, there are concepts like superposition, like entanglement, uh, techniques like an interference. Those are all used. So let's put it this way. To the degree mm-hmm. that quantum mechanics is, quote, real, Quantum computing is real too, <laughs> right? Real. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that definitely answers for Michael and makes a lot of sense to me at least. Uh, uh, and you've just brought it to something very simplified that even I could understand and relate what you're talking mm-hmm. about. So uh, makes sense to me. Thanks uh, for answering that question, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, also, you know, uh, obviously uh, there are many people who are joining in. I will just meet and greet everyone. We have uh, a few, I have a friend, Joanna. Uh, she's, uh, 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 I guess, uh, an intern with Qzit and she's doing an internship in quantum computing. So uh, obviously she was here and she was very excited about it and she wanted to learn more uh, about quantum computing and says, let's dance with the qubits, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. And a very interesting question that she had was uh, about uh, mathematical background. So uh, uh, Joanna says, uh, do you uh, have any advice for people who don't have background in mathematics uh, for not feeling overwhelmed when approaching the amazing quantum world? Well, it does depend on what your ultimate goal is. So on one hand, um, I might say, well, you don't have a background in mathematics, but you do want to learn the mathematics to to understand it. Mm. So, so I mean, that is one direction. You might not have that background. Um, or you, you might simply want to say, um, I haven't done the math. I'm not going to do the math. I don't want to do the math, but I still want to have an understanding (laughs) at least about what all this quantum stuff is, right? Um, In in that second way, let let me pose it this way. Um, The the way I like to think about it is that nature, and so nature, the universe, you know, everything, look around you, right? 
um, there are molecules, there are yeah. atoms, there are electrons, there are photons of light that are bouncing all around. And there are all these processes that mm. are going on. I mean, think of what's happening, you know, the biochemistry in your body, right? Enzymes and, and the way your brain works and everything like this. You can think of all those things as apps, <laughs> as software, you know, based on the hardware, <laughs> yeah. which ultimately are all the atoms and the molecules and, and things like that. So therefore, what the heck, let, let, let's think of nature as a, a great big computer. Right. So we've got all this information, a, a ridiculous amount of information. I, I mean, an unbelievably huge yeah. amount of information. And nature is the computer that is driving this. Now, nature is not a binary computer, you know, not just zeros and ones like we started talking about in the 1940s. Um, it has its own way of computing. That's quantum mm. computing. And so what we are after here yeah. is to understand the way that nature works and does its thing well enough so that we can replicate it as a form of physical computing and then apply it to some hard problems. Quantum computing yeah. um, is not for everything. It complements classical computing, right? They work together. Um, not every hard problem for classical computing is going to be helped by quantum computing, but there are certain classes of things, and, yeah. and that's what we're really going after. So it's, uh, you know, if, if you if, if you want to learn the math, my, my, my first thing, well, that is what I cover in the book. If you want to just think about nature and, and whatever, um, you can take a somewhat philosophical approach to it. Um, but yeah. um, but just think of it that way. Just, just think of it that way. You, you use the way everything around you works as a practical computing model. And if we're successful, um, I think we'll see quite a few breakthroughs. Yeah, I think that definitely is uh, a very interesting answer for someone who's uh, actually coming from a non-mathematical background. Or maybe how uh, you, know, you can have an approach. What's your approach is very important in this matter. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely, uh, it is something which is uh, uh, very helpful. So uh, also, uh, uh, Bob, I had a, another question which was uh, very interesting uh, by Scott Taylor. Hi, Scott. Uh, Scott is here. Um, he uh, Scott uh, is a uh, uh, the data whisperer and uh, is the mm -hmm. man <laughs> uh, in data. So he has a question. What he uh, is asking is, uh, what about quantum data management modeling? Is that a thing? Could it be a thing? Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, well, Scott, thank you for joining us, and thank you to you know just looking at some of the questions from people all around the world. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, let me also say that uh, I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm always happy to answer questions. You know, beyond this. Um, so Scott, there's quantum computing has this little data problem, <laughs> in which it cannot process much in the way of data. Um, mm. If you think way, way back to computers in the 1950s, you know we didn't have these beautiful terminals or phones or things like this. The way you actually coded them was by flipping switches up or down, and those were the zeros and ones. Of course, eventually we got much more sophisticated than that. Um, Current quantum computers have no way of reading data from disk. They have no way of writing data to disk. Now, classical computers can do this, but in the middle of a quantum computation, there is no instruction <laughs> that says, read this information mm -hmm. from disk. Um, moreover, there's the question of how do you actually encode it? Because remember, we're not using zeros and ones. So it, it's, it's called data loading. There is some early research on this, but quantum computers will have to be significantly larger, really significantly larger, yeah. like in the thousands, of, tens of thousands of qubits before we can even begin to think about that. There's also one other little, li little glitch, <laughs> if you will, and this may seem very strange to people, which is you can't copy quantum information. So if you do classical yeah. program, or, or Scott, you know, let's say you know you load a record from a database, and then you say, well, let's make a copy of that record. So now I have two copies of the information that was from that database. Can't do that with quantum. Can't do that with quantum information. <laughs> it's called the no cloning theory, and so okay. you you don't 
copy information from place to place. You must move it from place to place. And this is, you know, a, a big restriction when it comes to, to data yeah. management and, and just the core question of what it means. So to answer your, your question, um, before we could even begin to think about data management, we have to think about uh, the notions of quantum memory, and we have to have much larger machines that can manipulate and load that information in order to do something useful. All right. Yeah, I think uh, that definitely answers for Scott. And uh, when you were just talking about uh, something that we can only move, the data can only be moved and not be copied. Looks like a very big restriction. I don't know how, how much it's uh, of use or maybe implemented right now in terms of uh, uh, obviously uh, in use, but uh, maybe they, uh, do you think Bob, there'll be a loophole for that uh, as well, where we can either copy the data and rather than moving in quantum? Well, you'll have to think about the problem in a different way. now. I, I do want to immediately say, you said it sounds like a restriction, but recall before I said, nature seems to work this way with, yeah. mm. for our brains, a seemingly infinite amount of data. So clearly something's possible, right? Clearly there mm. are models in which we can do things. They just may not be the traditional ways of thinking about things. Um, when it comes to practical problems, it therefore means that quantum, shouldn't be used for saying, hey, I'm going to suck in gigabytes of data and then do something with them, right? Instead, you want to think about you're loading some information to set up your problem. Yeah. And then when the quantum computer is, is running, is executing whatever algorithm, what happens is, is that um, in, in some cases, some types of algorithms, uh, the number of things you have to examine just just expands, and in in fact, you know, the idea is that in the middle of the computation, you are potentially dealing with a tremendous amount of information. It's not information that you loaded into it; it's information okay. that was part of the calculation that you then somehow have to weed through with your quantum algorithms in order to get what we'll call quote the correct answer. So it's a different type of model of, uh, from classical computing where you tend to think of, I'm going to load a lot of information, I'm going to process a lot of information, and then I'll spit out the result. Um, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why uh, we say, well, it's not a replacement for classical computing, but it's also not for every type of problem either. Okay. Yeah, I think that that is definitely making a lot of sense to me, at least, uh, where, uh, you know, it is about more of a nature and it's not about the restriction that you say. Yeah. So, yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, there was Jay, a comment. If, uh, wait, wait. Well, I, I want to insert one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sure. so Jay, Jay Gambetta runs the IBM Quantum Program. He's a brilliant I, IBM fellow. Um, several years ago, we made up these little stickers um, from something he said. And, and that little simple thing was, you're thinking too classically. So for <laughs> anybody who is now thinking about mm -hmm. quantum computing, do not say <laughs> when you're learning about it, that makes no sense. Things should work this yeah. way. Well, that's mm. just arbitrary. You know, a lot of the, the things, you know, classically, that's part of that model. It's not necessarily part of different models. So you will find yourself confused mm. and then you will have breakthroughs <laughs> and you'll say, that's what they mean, <laughs> right? So expect that, expect to learn something and then step back and then go forward and then step back and then go forward. And eventually you'll see how the pieces start to fit together. Wow, very interesting. I think it is something that uh, we need to have a classical approach to earn something which will be over modernized. We, we, we might achieve the results might be uh, overwhelming and might be amazing, but uh, it has a classical approach that we need to understand. Yes. Uh, Thanks, Bob, for that. And uh, we had an interesting comment from Otto SG. Greetings from Kiev. Um, uh, finished the book a couple of months ago. Robert is so great at explaining thing and structure of the book is near perfect. He already uh, he also had a follow up question after that. Uh, that said, uh, I would like to ask what is the chance uh, that in 20 to 30 years, quantum programming will be as accessible, widespread and popular as coding on Java, C++, etc. 
Uh, well, first, thank you. Um, I, I, I am a little concerned about the near perfect. I'm trying to go back in my mind saying, uh, but uh, I, that's a joke. Uh, um, <laughs> well, you can program quantum computers right now. And so, you know, here I do have to remind you, I, I, I work for IBM, uh, part of the IBM quantum yeah. program. Um, right now, you can go online. We have two tools, the IBM Composer and the IBM, the IBM mm -hmm. Quantum Composer, the IBM Quantum Lab. Uh, you can use Python. You can load what's called the QuizKit libraries. QuizKit is a um, is a large Python package uh, for quantum programming. Um, in fact, just just the plug Pact has has three books about that. Um, uh, one uh, in particular by my my colleague Robert Laredo. So, yeah. if you know Python coding right now, uh, you can get up and running, and you can write code that runs on real quantum computers. In fact, just search Amazing. the IBM Quantum Composer and you can do this. Now, Amazing. What, when we talk about Java, C, C++, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of developers. And last estimate I saw, right. I mean, just for Python, was that there are about 8 million Python coders out there. Wow. So, so the question is, well, when will there be that many <laughs> that also happen to know what? quantum coding, right? Um, hey, exactly. we're, we're making surprising progress. Um, uh, we, uh, in the, the IBM Quantum and, and the QuizKit communities last summer, um, held an online workshop. Um, and in fact, all the lectures are online uh, on, on YouTube. Um, and the idea was saying, Look, let's do a two-week workshop in the middle of the summer for us, which was July, and see how many people show up. <laughs> you know, it's virtual. It's it's, it's not a problem. Six thousand people registered, and over four thousand people showed up. Wow! Uh, we're doing something with the coding school, and this is uh, over a much longer period of time, a semester or so, and um, we had agreed with them we would help sponsor five thousand people. 10,000 people signed up, right? Exactly, and, yeah, and, no, uh, yeah. And eventually we had to have, you know, 6,000 attended the course. <laughs> so there are today thousands of people who are learning to code quantum today. Um, so just uh, Otto, getting back to your question about accessible, widespread, um, accessible, you're there today. That is, you can use real quantum computers on the cloud, you can use them at no charge, right? Uh, for the, the fancy ones, the more powerful ones, yes, that's a special program, but you can do yeah. that. Widespread, we're working on that. And there are a lot of great online resources to help you do that. Popular, well, that's going to take time. <laughs> Popular depends on the numbers and things like this. So um, I, I, I think you should think of it as, um, in the short term, um, Python coders who also know how to code in uh let's say quiz kit, right, and, and do it. So we're, yeah. we're on our way. We have ways to go, but the numbers are much larger than you might have suspected already. Okay, fantastic. I think uh, that answers for Otto that uh, obviously it's out there. It is uh, real mm -hmm. already. So it's just about going out there and, you know, giving that mm -hmm. space. Also talking about, uh, obviously, we, were, we just spoke about coding and Python. Uh, so that brings me to a very important topic and uh, could be mm -hmm. the first time that maybe uh, we might talk about it. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, okay, first thing, obviously, Dancing with Qubits is uh, Bob's first book. So don't forget to uh, pick this up if you are interested in uh, quantum, to learn about quantum computing, definitely. But I, I know for a fact that they, you're writing another book and very excited to know about it. When hmm. I will keep quiet about it, but I would want to know about, uh, about it from you. Is it on Python and uh, what is it about? Please. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, we haven't talked publicly about this before. So. Yes. First, first, let me quickly go back. Um, Dancing with Qubits, I think, has yes. one of the strangest titles for a quantum computing book. Um, exactly. <laughs> but I wanted to make it interesting, and I didn't want to make it yet another introduction to quantum computing. And you know, that is, I didn't want to have one of these generic introductory sort of titles. By dancing um, in it, um, 
I'm referring to what's called quantum entanglement. And I mentioned this somewhere in, in the book. Yeah. And it's the idea how qubits become very tightly correlated in algorithms. They work together for a while and then they separate as the algorithm proceeds. So, so I kind of think of this as, as the dance of the qubits, right? As they work together yeah. and separate and come back together and things like that. So I kind of like that title and I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah, exactly. Now, I did not put very much coding. In, in the book. So I, I the, the Dancing with Cubits, I mentioned QuizKit. I didn't really want to talk about that because uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I feel the foundation is to comfortably explain the mathematics and the foundations for quantum computing, right? To fill in the gaps yeah. and to get you going, to, right? right? It wasn't to explain the latest leading edge thing, but it was to give you enough so you could read those papers, right? You could read more advanced yeah. books and things like that. Um, and, and that was the goal. Um, I also didn't want to have to keep updating it because any book with coding, um, if yeah. the libraries are changing, you have to keep coming up with a second edition, a third edition, a fourth edition, and things like that. And Dancing with Cupids was so much work, you know, I didn't want to have exactly. to keep updating it very much. So I wanted that to kind of sit as a foundation, but I was well aware yeah. of the idea of coding. Now, Right. Traditionally, the way a lot of people learn learn coding, um, well, they might learn Python. So you get a book or you take a course on Python and, and there you go. And then when quantum comes along, you then um, read one of the, the several excellent books about QuizKit or you do things online. There's the online QuizKit textbook, but it's still broken into two pieces. That is learn Python, then learn quantum. So I mm. said, what if I could write a book that would do them both from the very beginning? So what if I wrote an introduction to Python book? Well, and yeah. in addition to talking about integers and floats and strings and lists and things like this, I also introduced Ooh. qubits and gates and things like that. So right. could I make the quantum coding part of it seem as natural as the classical coding part of it. And wow. that's what the book is. It's now looking like it's going to be about 15 chapters with a few appendices. Uh, there's a lot of Python code. You'll, you'll, you'll learn how to code Python. Um, and, yeah. But you'll also learn the basics of using QuizKit, of setting up quantum circuits, uh, basic gates, and uh, to give you what I hope is an integrated view of classical mm. plus quantum coding. And then of course you can move on and get more advanced. So, so I am, um, I'm about, um, of course there's always editing, <laughs> but um, 13, 13 of the 15 chapters are done. Um, and so there's Ooh. another couple of months worth of work and editing and, you know, you, you know the last minute Fingers stuff crossed. you have to do. <laughs> I yeah. know. Um, and uh, and uh, my working title is Dancing with Python. So, wow. I, I love the title and uh, mm -hmm. the idea behind what you've just got up uh, with is uh, fantastic. I think, uh, Bob, also this will be the first book uh, ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, where uh, Python uh, is done in quantum space, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, as, an, as, an, as an introduction, as an introduction. Yeah. As an introduction, so. at least, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, so very excited about it. Also, uh, since we're talking about the book, uh, I, I had a very generic question, though. Uh, what What do you love about, uh, you know, uh, writing a book? Uh, I know it's a lot of work. There's uh, too much to and fro when you start uh, writing a book. Then there, there's complete approach that you need to decide how will it actually help the audience if you're putting in so much time, obviously, and what should be the results? What are you expecting out of it? Uh, because obviously, you, you can't go out mm -hmm. uh, for everyone. The book is not for everyone. If it's for beginners, it's just for beginners. So uh, yeah. what's, what's, what are the two or three things that you love uh, writing about a book? Uh, would love to know about that. Well, let me say right up front, and it, it's, it's, it's not just, well, I mean, you and I have worked together and you know, exactly. you work for PAC, the publisher. Um, I, <laughs> I have a certain idea. This uh, Dancing with Cubits was actually my second book. The, um, the first book, though, was 29 years ago, so we can forget about that. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I went with Pact for Dancing with Cubits because you showed 
incredible amount of flexibility in letting me write the book I wanted to write. Right? Uh, I mean, you publish hundreds of titles. Um, uh, many of them are very hands-on, very specific to technologies. You have to learn this, yeah. but this this was a different type of book for you, I believe. In exactly. Speaking. And and so you allowed me a lot of latitude. Um, I caused um, our 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 joint friend Amit Ramadas um, a lot of headache yes. <laughs> in producing the book. <laughs> Because I uh, I, I'm sure he loves all of it. I'm <laughs> sure we love, you know, always uh, Bob, no. uh, you know, having those late night conversations for us at least. Uh, it is so much, mm. uh, you know, sitting for, down for two hours straight and, you know, you're sending out the message about uh, the book and uh, what do you think about it? What should be the approach? Those are the things I think uh, can be learned. And, you know, it clearly shows how uh, passionate you are about quantum computing, about the subject, about what you're building. So it is always a pleasure, and I'm sure Amit might uh, second me on that. Yeah. Yeah, we we've already been talking back and forth today about the, the new book on several. <laughs> um, oh, that's but but so 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 I, I I want to you know earnestly thank you, and you know in terms of the process because I felt it was a collaboration with you. You you simply didn't print a PDF that I happened to produce, right? Um, and and so there was that. And and so you know when you asked me what I liked about it, <laughs> was well you know I I did have an idea of, of what I wanted to do. Now when I do these books, um, while I may simplify and say I, I I write the book, I wrote the book, really I write and I build the book. And so I have a model of how all the different pieces have to come together. There's a lot of technology that goes into producing my books, right? Um, that that I try to do and then minimize it on, on your, your part. Um, because I, I want people to feel like uh, they're standing right next to me and we've got like a whiteboard. And, and I hope I'm being very patient and the idea is that we're just going to keep working on ideas until they are um, uh, they're, they're understood, right? Maybe not yeah, completely exactly. obvious, but but understood and really go back and forth until this person says, "Aha! Now I get it. Okay, now we can go on." So mm -hmm. so to do that, you know, there's a certain narrative through the book, right? It's not just a sequence of chapters. They're they're in a specific order. Uh, they build in certain ways. They refer back and forth, and you know these aha moments are like that's why he did that. Ah, okay, um, <laughs> right, and not just kind of an so accumulation. True. Yeah, so um, so so that's what I like about it. You know, I've always liked uh, way back when I was an undergraduate and, and as a graduate student. Of course, I taught. You know, in, in math, mm -hmm. um, I've always liked that. I've always liked to try to make um, scientific topics better understood. I'm excited about them. I think other people should be too, right? And so this is my, my, my way of doing it. Um, so, so yeah, it's that combination. And, and ultimately, um, I, I, I feel that um, I'm making something with the book. I mean, yeah, that's very satisfying too, right? That, that mm. it's con that's concrete, it's tangible, here it is. Um, I like that quantum computing for most people is very new. I like having the chance to be one of the first to introduce them to it. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, as I said, it's a lot of work, but when it's done, it's very satisfying. So yeah, exactly. No, I think uh, exactly, Bob. Like you said, you know, but it's been more than a year. The book is published now, uh, yeah. but till date, uh, you know, when I go out there and obviously I have a banner with the book, uh, you know, uh, on my profile photo itself, and people might be so interested if I go out there to a conference and I'm like, uh, okay, we do, you know, Pack does have books uh, in quantum computing too, and uh, obviously your books co uh, book comes up first in my mind, and I'm like uh, dancing with cubits, and people are like. Okay, we need to read that if they mm -hmm. haven't. And there are so many people who have reached out to me already. And they're like, 
okay this is the book we love and uh the the explanation which has gone into it it is so clear and so straightforward mm -hmm. that uh exactly like you said uh, the person uh if you're writing a book the person should feel that they're just standing next to you and there's a whiteboard out there and it, it clearly uh you know clarifies uh, the whole subject uh, to them that okay this mm -hmm. is what what it looks like what it is and i think that's a win-win uh, and that's one of the reasons, you know, uh, uh, I can assure you that Pat loves uh, uh, the books, the masterpieces that you're creating and mm. then uh, oh, the one you. in the making too. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Bob, for doing that. Sure. Um, hey, yeah, you know, yeah. one, one question I, I, I do get um, since we're just talking about book creation is uh, the yeah. beginning the beginning process. So, yeah. Um, First of all, for any of you who are thinking of writing a book, it's going to take a lot more time than you think it will. Um, I estimate yes, dancing <laughs> with, I think dancing with cubits, I estimate it took about 1500 hours altogether. And that's oh a lot of, lot of lunches and evenings and weekends and, and, and things like that. Um, but you have to convince yourself that you've got something there, right? Because it's very flattering to be asked to write a book, but if you're going to write a book, write a good book. <laughs> right? Let's put it that way, right? <laughs> write, write something that you're, feel you're going to be proud of. So the way I did it um, with dancing with Cubits and, and with this new one is I sat down. Um, so in the summer of 2018 for Dancing with Cubits, um, I wrote the preface. And my mm -hmm. preface lo looks a lot like the preface for many of the packed books, but it's a very logical type of thing. It gives a little introduction to the book. Yeah. Um, it says, um, you know, for whom did I write this book? Right. So, so what are you doing, but who's going to read it really? Um, and, and then you actually put down an outline of the chapters of the book. So you, you therefore have to think at least at the top level, step by step by step by what you're covering. And only once you do that, and once you fill in like a little paragraph for each chapter, can you convince yourself that there's enough there. Because you don't want to write a 37 page book. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to get to the point saying, oh, I got, I got nothing to say, right? Um, and, and, and then what I did with, with, with Dancing with Cubits was I just let it sit for three or four months, right? Because um, mm. we, weren't, we hadn't been talking at all. This was just an idea yeah. back in my mind. Um, and, um, and then I returned to it in the fall. And then I started talking to some folks at the time. Um, Andrew Waldron was with you. He was the acquisition editor. Yeah, um, and um, then we started talking in, in earnest. And and but what I could present to you was, at that point, the preface and a two-level outline. So every chapter, and then sections within that. And of course, they all changed a little bit, and we moved some things around. Yeah. Um, some things that I thought would go in there did not go in there at all. Um, but in working with you in the editorial process, it shapes it. So what was to be an entire part was shortened and became the first chapter, which ended up being much better than what that part would have been. Um, and so this is the building. This is the crafting, if you will, from beginning yeah. to end. Yeah, I think it's, it's for the team that uh, you know, also uh, goes behind and you know also uh, has a look at your uh, the the pre-finals and the uh, chapters that you're putting in, and it kind of helps uh, obviously. But uh, obviously, writing a book is uh, definitely first thing. Thinking about it is a big process. Uh, we also have Kate Strachan here. She 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 mentioned that she's also in the early stages of writing a book, and uh, yeah, even writing the table of content is taking longer than expected. Yeah. So that's so true. Do you have yeah, any tips for writing book, uh, well, Bob and Hub, for the people who are just starting off? I know Kate is starting with a very unique book that is uh, Colors Visualization uh, on the data visualization bit. And it is very important uh, because she's focusing on colors basically in all levels and uh, catering, uh, wanting to understand her audience well. So she's in that phase. Do you have any tips? So, yeah. well, so um, Kate, just a, just a mechanical practical model here is don't just sit down and write the table of contents so if you're using word let's just imagine you're using word um i use i didn't use word at all in the first book and i'm using it in a very <laughs> strange way in the second book um, but build your table of contents by actually writing chapter outlines 
So that is make a new chapter with the title, create some dummy empty sections, right? Write a new chapter, create some dummy, and then let Word create the table of contents automatically for you. And it's a psychological trick versus just writing down a table of contents. Mm. Because, because just by doing that, I, I mean, let, let's just imagine that. So let's say you think they're gonna be 15 chapters. Um, you're gonna throw in a few sections. You're probably gonna have like 40 pages of mostly blank page uh, book, right? Because they're just headings, but it feels like something, <laughs> right? I said, it's a psychological <laughs> trick. Psychological right? thing. And, right. and then you then you have Word generate the table of contents and you can stare at it, right? And then you can go back and play with it. And so um, it feels like you're dealing with something which is more than what you really have, but it's a constructive way because you visualize, you know, in terms of the book, you, you can kind of say, well, this is the way the chapter is going to look like, right? This is the sequence of this. I can see them. I can move them around or this should go before that. And it's much easier than just a, an, a list. Uh, so um, um, the other thing too um, that I did early on, going just back to the chapters. Um, so I mentioned I wrote the preface. I did what I just described with the kind of uh, chapter headings, section headings, all empty. But then the next step was to write a paragraph or two at the beginning of every chapter. So this was the introduction to the chapter, a paragraph or two. And again, obviously there's, you know, another 30 pages to write, but that cements in your head. And once again, gives you something more concrete. So my, my suggestion is work from the outside in for a little while, right? Just as I've described this. And then once you've solidified, once you're happy with that, once every, you know, your editor is happy with that, then you can go to a particular part and start fleshing it out. So, um, so much of this is psychological, you know. Um, uh, people talk about writer's block. Usually I think people talk about it more with fiction than nonfiction. Um, but I've learned something about myself, which is when I get writer's block about a section, I just can't lay it down. I just can't. It's because it shouldn't be there. I'm having such trouble <laughs> figuring out how to write it is because it just really doesn't fit. And so I, I, I try not to be rash. I give it a few days and then I delete it and say, you know, that's, that's not right. It shouldn't be there. So anyway, so, so Kate, best, best of luck with it. I'm, the, the topic sounds fascinating. Yeah, I think yes, definitely. I've seen the post that goes out uh, from Kate about the color book and uh, her. I, I think the the way she's thinking about a book, uh, the approach is fantastic. And yeah, all the best, Kate. Uh, and thanks for that tip, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, we also we have Otto's uh, talking about the book. It is a great book. Really inspired me to learn more about quantum computing. It feels great to try to change the way thinking when you dive deeper into the topic. That's so true, I guess. It's, um, you, you know, it's one of the few things in our lifetimes that's so radically different. You know, we can talk, uh, you know, if you are of a certain age, <laughs> let's say you remember when the web came in, right? The web came in in the mid nineties, right? Uh, iPhone, um, smartphones, late, late nineties, uh, except not late nineties. Uh, iPhone was 2007 and things like that. But it, it seems like the, the, the next generation of technology, we're very used to the next generation, you know, more memory, more capability, more interesting apps to do things. Quantum is one of the few completely different things, just completely mm. different. And so you can put everything you know on one side and say, I'm just gonna delve into the, this other thing for a while. And you don't have all these other thoughts polluting you, you know, <laughs> you, you can just focus on that. And, and so I yeah. think it's very satisfying. It's also something from science fiction, right? Um, people have been talking about quantum this, quantum that in science fiction since the mid 1900s, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, so dealing with something that's now real from science fiction to reality yeah. is, is pretty cool also. Yeah, exactly. That's like a journey, you know, where, where you just st where people were just thinking about it and it's it has become real and you are into it and you are just building something out there. So it's a very, very uh, proud feeling. I think it's like an achievement already. 
So uh, yeah, sounds good, uh, Bob. Also, uh, there was an interesting question, Bob, from mm -hmm. Neeraj Satpal. Uh, do you think once uh, scientists have begun um, to master error connection, they will have uh, to repeat nearly every development so far in quantum computing with most robust logical qubits? So uh, let me explain a couple of terms there. Um, today, yeah. when we so. talk about quantum computers, um, that is actual computers, the qubits in them are physical qubits. So they could be, in our case, uh, what are called superconducting qubits. Some people are dealing with um, atomic ions. Some people are dealing with photons and there, there are several uh -huh. other approaches. These are all physical qubits. They exist in the real world. They are surrounded by all the quantum activity that, that that's happening around us, you know, light and, and just chemical reactions and, and, and things like that. So when you try to create a, a qubit, there's a lot of noise that's around it just because of the environment. Now, when you read a book like mine or many other ones, um, if, if we're not specifically talking about physical qubits, the term we use is logical qubits. So you would have a qubit, you would put it in a certain quantum state, and it would just stay there forever, <laughs> right? You could go eat dinner, <laughs> you know, and it's it's perfectly like that. Physical qubits don't do that. You put them in a certain configuration, and after a while, they start to degrade, right? Some last longer than others, but the ones that last longer are slower in other ways and things like this. So um, Niraj's question is, is is building from this saying, well, we have these physical qubits, but all the books talk about logical qubits. How do we get right. from the physical to the logical? And this process is called error correction. It's getting, it's essentially yeah. eliminating the effects of the noise. If the noise is causing an error in the computation, then we say, one, we can say, ah, it happened. And two, if it's not too bad, we can fix it. So this is error correction, also called fault tolerance. So given all this, um, and, and we expect to start seeing partial error correction toward the second half of this decade, it doesn't have to be complete. It just has to be enough for a long enough period of time. Um, we will not repeat everything we did. We'll just continue to evolve. We do have algorithms that will work with physical qubits. Um, for for some time now, um, but as as we move toward error correction, the algorithms will change. We'll be able to use other algorithms, and and will advance uh, in different ways. Mm -hmm. It's going to involve a lot of physical qubits. It's going to involve some very sophisticated control hardware to do this. So at this point, my, my key word here: it's evolution toward logical qubits. It's not repeating what we did. Okay, it's more of the evolution side which will happen uh, with time right. and uh, yes, definitely answers for Neeraj. Also, there is a quick, uh, uh, okay, uh, Joanna says, uh, thank you for sharing behind the scenes of the process of writing your book. Uh, now reading your book will be more meaningful uh, than just reading about quantum, obviously, because the hard work that has gone behind writing that book, uh, uh, trust me, uh, uh, Bob knows about it firsthand, then the editorial mm -hmm. team, then obviously packed in uh, but bob knows it for real how much it goes so yes thanks bob for creating the masterpiece dancing with qubits uh, <laughs> thank you works out there and uh, happy to be associated and be that partner to partner with you where i can you know go out there and amplify the book to uh, you know people who are interested to the community the quantum community who's looking to learn and educate themselves in quantum so and it has helped a, a, a many people out there and people are still looking at it still learning like you like you said earlier that uh, you know there's so much that people would want to learn about it and want to know more about this and it's just very limited to people that okay we want to learn but uh, we're not getting the right information and ibm is doing all the right things to you know make sure that uh, quantum space grows in uh, at a very high level which is uh, respectable. So thank you very much uh, to IBM too. And uh, yes, definitely. Kate says, uh, I love the book title. I love the book title too. And uh, Thanks, the next Kate. title is Python, uh, <laughs> Dancing with Python. 
so that will be interesting yeah. again now uh, 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 bob by any chance uh, when is it when is the book publishing uh, do you do you have any the well the editorial deadline is the end of july um that's when i'm supposed oh, to have the it's not that far. Draft. no it's not that far but it's comfortable um at this point i'm i i feel i'm ahead um but that simply mm. means um i'll have more time to polish it a bit um i've yeah. been getting sure. um uh, I've already been working with the editors, uh, incorporating comments from the technical reviewer, uh, from the uh, design editor, uh, some proofreads, um, which is a fascinating concept. And for all you potential authors out there, um, let me give you a couple words of advice. First is, if anyone tells you something isn't clear, it's not clear. <laughs> you know, put your pride aside. If one person doesn't think it's clear, a thousand people will think it's not clear. Rewrite it, okay? Second yeah, we, thing is, I used to think I knew how to use commas. <laughs> Literally commas. <laughs> and I seem to be taking forever adding commas and removing commas and things like this. Um, and, and good editors are like that, but there are tools like Grammarly if you're using Word that really, right. really, really do help. It, it's, it's worth the investment yes. in time. Um, and then the third thing, which I want to say is edit early, edit early. Um, whenever you write something the very next time you go to sit down and write, reread what you did the day before. Yeah. Mm. Try to fix it up. Um, one mistake I made with Dancing with Cubits was I wrote four chapters at the very beginning straight through and then only went mm -hmm. back to edit and it was such a pain oh, in the yeah. neck and it was so painful <laughs> and um i couldn't believe what stupid mistakes i made early on and so for me at least editing is the least favorite part of the entire thing so try to break it up into little chunks but do it constantly mm -hmm. it's not an edit at the yeah. end it's a continual edit of what you've got right mm -hmm. It's like a process where, you know, you just need to be very much in touch. Maybe if you start, you know, you put five chapters together and then you again jump back to the first first, first uh, chapter, it might be, you know, where you lose all the concentration because obviously mm -hmm. uh, you've just gone five chapters ahead. So, yeah, makes sense. Thanks, Bob, for that. And uh, there was a quick question from Jonathan uh, Lencher. Uh, interesting question. Is there <laughs> one dramatic way in which you foresee quantum computing changing our everyday lives? I know John. John's a colleague of mine. Okay. Um, so I think quantum will sneak in and we won't even necessarily know it. Um, I tell a story about, uh, I used to be involved with the Linux business in IBM. And this was 15 years or so ago when we really would focus on saying this software runs on Linux and things like this. And so we would go and we'd ask clients, um, have you used Linux today? And the clients would say, oh, no, I use a Mac, I use Windows. Why would I use Linux? Linux is for geeks and the other things like this. And then we would say, have you accessed the web today? Have you done a web search? Do you realize that you know Linux is underlying an awful lot of that? So the point being is that many of these advanced technologies will be hidden from you. You're gonna be interested in just doing something. Now, you really don't know. I mean, with the cloud, you don't even know where it's being done. I mean, just to give you an idea, um, my website, robertsutor.com, is hosted in Utah. Okay. Um, I'm in New York. <laughs> I mean, it's 2,000 miles from here. Does it make any difference to me? No, no, not at all. Right? So, so there are things that will happen under the covers. Um, the sorts of... Um, ways um, where I think we will probably see quantum computing is uh, new materials uh, being created. So that is uh, people who, who manufacture cars, planes, all sorts of things would love new alloys that perhaps um, don't corrode as easily. So material science as it relates to chemistry, right? Um, uh, Batteries, lithium batteries. Lithium, uh, as it turns out, it's good. It's a very small atom. Um, listen, lithium sulfide, uh, these are very small molecules. There's a lot of tremendous work that's going on right now 
to, to use, uh, to get on the right track to use quantum computers to make better types of lithium batteries. And so that will be reflected in cars, vehicles, um, wow. certainly sustainability um, issues like that. Um, eventually, um, you'll probably see it in some of your personal finance, you know, things that are happening in your bank behind the covers, you know, recommendations you might get if, if you, um, if you have any retirement savings, right? And like that, mm -hmm. some sort of, um, combination of stocks or bonds or, or things like that. Um, in the United States, we call it a 401k as an example. Um, mm -hmm. the recommendations you get in 10 years might have a quantum computer helping balance the risk depending on who you are and how old you are and things like that. So when we talk about financial services, we're not just talking about big mm -hmm. banks and hedge funds. Um, I think it'll um, ultimately be reflected in some of our own finances and the way we deal with money. Mm, I think it is getting real now. Now, uh, at least a uh, uh, fantastic question, first of all, from Jonathan, obviously, because, uh, you know, a person like me would want to understand, obviously, that how can I actually see, uh, you know, quantum computing being used in our day to day life? And if these are the things where, you know, uh, it is taking over, I think uh, it has a long, long way to go. And there are many more things which might come up. So, yeah, it, thanks for that. It's yeah. You must have patience, though. I really caution everybody. We're all used to to new technology, where someone where you hear about it, and then you say, "Hey, I'll go buy it. I'll use it tomorrow." Exactly. Right? <laughs> Quantum. It's not like that. It's going to develop over a period of years. It's going to take a while to mm -hmm. get machines that are big enough and powerful enough, and then because the programming model is so different to actually come up with algorithms that do useful things. We have some, right? We're on the right track in many different directions. So remember this, you know, this, this whole thing where I told you, you have to go off and rethink it, you know, without all this other stuff. This means right. from the very basics of the hardware through the software, through the systems, to the applications and the use cases. So be patient, right? But be part of it, <laughs> be part of it. And if anyone yeah. is in university right now, um, I mean, this is true for everybody, but um, within 10 years, it'll be part of your working life, I think, if you're somehow involved with software development. So um, t take that as either advice or a warning. Um, <laughs> at some, <laughs> some point, you'll have to jump in, right, depending on what you like and what you're interested in. Yes, uh, Bob, and uh, I'm sure they might be reading maybe your fifth or sixth book by then uh, in the universities as well. <laughs> uh, well, every, everyone, I'm going to make trickier for you people to print, but you know, uh, yeah, it's not actually the printing though; it's the ebook. That's where I keep giving you e headaches. But. Yes, <laughs> no, but uh, all sounds good, uh, Bob, and uh, we love the way you're publishing, you know, you're coming up with new ideas uh, and writing book and keep that for the community. Please do keep doing that. It's a it's a real gift. Even Dancing with Qubits is not only a gift for the community, but uh, for the quantum space itself. Uh, I would say because, um, uh, you know, trust me, I have had people reaching out from uh, different uh, you know i don't know from uh, where even they even they know about you know me being associated with you on dancing with qubits obviously we market the book and all of those things and we get it get get you know the book to the community but uh, it still uh, is so powerful that people uh, want to learn uh, learn about it and are benefiting out of it so don't stop uh, keep that going and uh, yes looking forward to uh, dancing with python Okay. Definitely that is something on the minds. And um, before we wrap up or before we uh, move up, uh, what uh, I would uh, uh, actually what we can do is, Bob, uh, can we just uh, give a sneak peek about uh, your website to everyone here and you can, uh, you know, just let them know what how they can benefit out of your website, what's in there and what are the things uh, you talk about? Sure. So, so yeah, a couple, couple of things. So, so first, the website is very simple, robertsutor.com. Um, I, um, I have some certain standing pages there that, that you can see. There's a list of uh, YouTube videos you can jump to if you want to learn more about quantum computing. Um, 
lately I've been doing a weekly list of news around quantum computing. Um, I've, always, I've, wow. I've played with this concept through the years now. It's coming out on Sunday. So it's a list of half a dozen or so articles that I think are interesting that, that people might care about. Um, what you were scrolling past there is something in the IBM Quantum Composer. Uh, it was a little quiz related to uh, doing those things. What you're seeing is a circuit, what you are seeing, and some, some gates. It does something yeah. in particular. Uh, I'm going to try to do a little bit more of that, just a little quantum brain teasers. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and whatever strikes my fancy, you know? I mean, I, 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 I do try to keep it mostly related to quantum. Um, yeah. But, you know, the tools I use, I talk about Visual Studio, things like this. Now, a um, little bit, uh, the, the other place where I do things is on LinkedIn. And I'm very active there. And, um, for example, I advertise this. Um, and um, I, I'm always throwing up some news. Now, now, look, I will warn you, this is IBM-centric. IBM pays me. Um, but we're also incredibly active about this. Um, so... Uh, they could be about events. Um, this last week, I uh, moderated and was on one panel at the Quantum Tech Conference. Um, oh. At some point, I'll put some links um, to those. In fact, the, there are a few of those. Yeah, you can see videos. You can see all sorts of stuff. So so between the two places, um, I, I try to keep people um, up on at least the sorts of things I'm looking at or, or thinking about. Uh, one other thing, which I wish I didn't have to do, but I, I you know, writing a book. Um, if you go to the, the page um, on my website, which is for the book, um, yeah. for, for Dancing with Qubits, um, if, you, if you just go back, um, yeah, scroll down on the left there. There's a little bit for the, the book it's, itself. Um, scroll down, scroll down. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I rearranged the website. I'm so sorry. Scroll back up to the top. I changed the theme. <laughs> this is the thing. All right. No, so I, see what see where it says book dancing with cubits? Way up on the top. Yeah. You gotta go back. Yep. Um, okay. Down at the bottom of that page, there's a link to a PDF. Now, I hate to admit this, but there are a few corrections that had to be made. Um, to um, yeah, you're not quite in the right place, but um, uh, in any case, okay. there are there are a list of little little glitches that crept in. Um, as we reprint the book, we we capture these and, and fix them. But there is a complete list in case you're reading something and it doesn't quite make sense. Please just take a look at that, and we'll, we'll clean yep. it up. But uh, as I said, I hate to admit that, <laughs> but it wasn't just me editing this book. So I, you know, I take full responsibility, but maybe not all of the book. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, but Bob, uh, fantastic conversation. I'm so sorry about the technical glitch that we had in the beginning, but uh, I think uh, it was no worth it. Is, uh, it uh, you know, and I would love to have you on the show back when we have the Dancing with Python coming up, because uh, that will be something that will uh, definitely help the uh, Python folks, the 8 million developers that you just uh, mentioned mm -hmm. about. And I'm sure everyone wants to learn more about quantum computing and Python together. And uh, the best part I like about your books are those uh, are more of an introductory sort books, uh, sort of books where mm -hmm. it can cater to a lot of audience and uh, people love it. So uh, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, it was fantastic talking to you. Yeah, and uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, and don't forget to have a look at Dancing with Cupid <laughs> and um, I will announce the winners soon. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, yeah. Bob. I keep thinking I should hold a, up a copy too. Thank you to everyone who's bought the book. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, and um, I, I'm always looking for suggestions or in fact, if there have to be improvements, um, but I, I do appreciate it. And I wish you a lot of luck on your, your quantum journey. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. See you everyone, bye-bye, take care and have a nice weekend. Take care, you too.